by two round of applause. The most familiar your tables, I think our table sponsors as well as the River House. They've done a fantastic job this morning, so let's give them a round of applause as well. And our media sponsors, Combined Communications, KTBZ, and Vent Radio Group. Uh, another round of applause. So we're going to roll right into this. On your, on your uh, tables there, there are index cards. Um, you'll see in there. Hey, if you have questions uh, at the end of the event, please write down, first of all, who you'd like the question to go to, and then hold them up, and our staff will come around and pick them up. We'll also have a mic roving around so you can ask questions directly. So there'll be both on cards and a microphone for you to um, ask questions to our guest speakers. And with that, I'm, oh, one more thing. We're tweeting. Everybody, uh, everybody tweets. Um, so we've got a live tweet going on, and it's hashtag vision15, vision15. OK. Now we're going to roll right into our guest speaker. Um, I'm going to invite both of them up. You know, it's a little bit different format here. It's uh, uh, Both these gentlemen wanted a little bit more of a casual uh, atmosphere, so we've got some very soft leather chairs for them to sit in. Uh, but it is a serious topic, so they, they will uh, get into the serious aspects of it. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark Kroll is the principal of Ferguson Wellman Wealth Management. He is a portfolio manager and a member of the equity team managing the energy sector. Uh, he received his BS in business from Oregon State University. He is a member and past president of the Chartered Financial Analyst Society of Portland. He serves as a trustee for the Providence Child Center Foundation, the Oregon State University Foundation, and the Oregon Symphony Board. Mark is a founding member of the Professional Ad Advisory Council on the Community Foundation for, for, for Southwest Washington and is on the Investment Committee and Plan Giving Committee of St. Vincent Hospital Foundation. He is also on the Campaign Committee for the Oregon State University Cascades Campus. Mark is a past chairman of the Board of Trustees and Investment Committee of the National American Red Cross Endowment. Will you please help me welcome Mr. Mark Kroll. Uh, our second guest is Professor Tim Dewey. He received his BA in economics in 1991 from the University of Puget Sound and his master's and PhD in economics in 1998 from the University of Oregon. Uh, following graduate school, Tim worked in Washington, D.C. for the U.S. Department of Treasury as an economist in the International Affairs Division and later with the G7 Group, a political and economic consultancy uh, for clients in the financial industry. Uh, in the latter position, he was responsible for monitoring the activities of the Federal Reserve and currency markets. Tim returned to the University of Oregon in 2002. He is the senior director of the Oregon Economic Forum and the author of the University of Oregon Statewide Economic Indicator, uh, Regional Economic Indicators, and the Central Oregon Business Index. Uh, Tim is published in the Journal of Economics and Business and is currently a member of the Oregon Governor's Council of Economic Advisors and the State Debt Policy Advisory Committee, uh, Commission. Will you please help me welcome Professor Tim Dewey. <laughs> and gentlemen, you're all mic'd up and ready to go? This one works so. <laughs> all right, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, we are gonna have a little different format today. Uh, last time we did this a few years ago, I had the charts on the uh, kind of global in the U.S. picture, and then Tim would do his on the uh, regional and state basis. And this year we're going to kind of blend the two together as we go along, so we're we'll talking about employment, we'll be bringing it down to uh, the local level. Um, and then when you, when you look at what the Fed's been talking about, unemployment, inflation, those are going to be the two first, the first two areas that we begin with bring that back down to how we think rates are going to be affected and then how that will flow through the marketplace. So that's kind of the format that we're going to look at. But I'll just make one comment quickly to Tim about some of the boards that I'm on. I think it was a bad decision on my part to be on the Red Cross board and the Oregon State University Foundation over in Corvallis. 
listening to guys like Scott Ashford telling us, did you see the front page of the bulletin today, by the way, when the big one happens? So Scott Ashford tells me how bad it's going to be, and then the Red Cross tells you what you need to do, and so I'm living in fear all the time. <laughs> it's, just, it's kind of crazy, but uh, read that article. It's actually a very good article. So with that, we'll go ahead and kick off and start talking about uh, our least favorite issue, although it's obviously improving in, uh, on a national basis as well as uh, on a regional basis. And it's, it's one of the things that the Fed has really been focused on. And basically, you're looking at a chart showing the, uh, the national unemployment rate over a 20-year period of time. And you see that large spike. And for most of us in this room right now, I think when you look at that, it's hard to remember where it seems like you know, quite a bit of history between us and that spike up to 10%. Although, on the other hand, it sure seemed like a long time for us to get back down to 5.9%, pretty close to, uh, to what is the uh, Fed consideration of full-term employment. And so that's, that's a real positive on a national basis that we have had that trend in place. And that's allowed the Fed, which we'll talk about more to, uh, as of yesterday, take the quantitative easing off the board, at least for the time being. And, and so that, that is a positive. We're seeing growth. One of the uh, kind of caveats on, on how that number has declined is the labor participation rate. Um, fewer people are in the workforce. And so there's, that looks like it'd be a very strong number, but it's probably not as strong as you would imagine as opposed to other cycles that we've had. And that's part of the reason why the Fed was really unwilling to, uh, to take the quantitative easing off the table as long as they did. Um, but it's, it is gone now, and, and the employment picture is, is improving. And part of the reason as well is, um, it's, it was actually hard to put charts together for this, because yesterday the Fed came out, today the GDP came out as a 3.5% hit on that, very positive. And the news keeps flowing, that's for sure. Um, I would I would sort of add on the um, unemployment rate that you know the, the the decline in labor force participation certainly drove down that that number. Uh, we probably think a lot of a lot of that decline is structural in nature. It's related to the baby boomers leaving rather than representing economic weakness. And the jury is really I think still out on how much the the um, uh, decline in labor force participation is due to the structural versus cyclical issues. And, I've argued that nothing interesting is going to really happen until we get below, you know, well below 6% unemployment. And that's the zone where if this is largely a cyclical phenomenon, or structural phenomenon, it's just people dropping out of labor force because they've aged out of labor force, you start to see, I think, faster wage growth. And so the next year, I think we'll start to answer some of those questions we've had about how much of this is structural and how much of this is cyclical. Just to comment on what the Fed's language was, I just took a bit couple of very brief quotes from their language yesterday. The September report that they had was that uh, the unemployment was little changed, and their new language uh, this month was solid job gains and lower and a lower unemployment rate was one of the reasons why they were able to take the quantity uh, easing off. And regarding the underutilization, uh, in September and previous months have been under underutilization remains significant. And now they're saying underutilization is gradually diminishing, so they felt very positive about being able to, uh, to remove the quantitative easing. The other thing that, that I remember, uh, and I'm sure Tim remembers this as well, when they first started doing that, they had a 7% target when they were going to start <coughs> cutting back. And as the unemployment rate, rate was dropping and then there was no pickup in, in the economy to, to speak of, they said, well, what we really need is six and a half. And then when we were approaching six and a half, and you still didn't see the economic momentum, he said, well, six, but we're going to be very flexible and look day to day at the numbers. So it became a very soft dashboard to start looking at as they went along. Right. No, that's, that's correct. They've been moving the goalposts, so to speak, as this uh, recovery has improved. And that's actually one of the reasons that you can be fairly optimistic that will sustain this recovery is that there seem to be no, they're, they're not very eager to raise interest rates at this point. They're willing to be patient until they see something that's very firm in the data that allows them to uh, uh, change course. And we have a couple of charts about that further back. Right. Um, and if we look at the Oregon and uh, local data, we're seeing very similar trends uh, where 
Um, you see market improvement in unemployment rate numbers. So you see, remember the, the worst recession, how quickly unemployment spiked in this area. And it's now come down and just a whisker away from the uh, uh, Oregon unemployment rate. So the, I think that's a testament to some very, very strong growth, particularly in the last two years in, in this region. Um, also probably due because uh, some people dropping out of labor force, but I think uh, we're really seeing the jobs uh, created uh, quite rapidly uh, here in, in the um, uh, local area. Now there's a little bit of uptick in the Oregon unemployment rate in the last couple of months. I am absolutely not worried about that one, one bit because that's a result of people coming back in the labor force. Uh, so that would suggest that uh, people are more confident about the economy. Also could point toward renewed immigration into Oregon. We know that's a, always been a strong a source of economic growth uh, for the state. So hopefully, you know, we're actually turning a corner here to a, a period of even, even greater momentum in, in some of these numbers. We um, then look at the housing, and uh, obviously that's been a big influence in the central Oregon area, and it was uh, going back to the, to the housing boom, the amount of uh, uh, building that was going on, and this is again is a national chart, and you do see that uh, after the steep sell-off, what you don't see is the other side of that where the uh, uh, growth in the housing starts was. Well, I wish we would have show, actually shown both sides of that, uh, and the level we're getting back to today. Again, it's at a much slower pace uh, than what we would have liked to have seen. Part of the reason that occurred as well is when the uh, the Fed was doing their quantitative easing. I don't know if you can remember, Operation Twist, when that was announced in 2011, in that time frame, uh, which was the Fed taking short-term treasuries that they already had and buying long-term treasuries. The, the, old, the thing I used to say for the first 30 years of my career, and I can't anymore, is the Fed really only influences short-term rates, you know, Fed funds. Uh, but beginning in 2011 with Operation Twist, they started affecting long-term rates, trying to drive down mortgage rates by Operation Twist, where they were buying or taking their short-term bonds, uh, uh, short-term uh, bills, and buying long-term treasury bonds, pushing those re rates down, creating a market for them, and um, it worked. And then Operation Twist ended. But when they did the quantitative easing Part Three and were putting new money and drove their balance sheet to four and a half trillion dollars, which is what they have today, they were just buying long-term bonds and uh, driving interest rates down. So there was a point in time, if you were refinancing or buying a home, you could get uh, a mortgage rate in the 3% range. And obviously that would help support if you had the down payment. That was a trick. Uh, you had to have the down payment. And a couple of years ago when we talked about this, we also talked about how more of the buyers of homes were investors. So as the Fed drove interest rates down, part of what they said was, if you hold short-term bonds, your, your payout is going to be basically a negative uh, real return. So we want to force you into other investments. So investors were going out and buying real estate and, and definitely helped drive up the, uh, the price of homes. Although the Case-Shiller number that came out this last week, uh, the rate of increase in the home prices dropped to, I think, 5% on a national level. Yeah, so I, I think that they did reflate some of those prices pretty quickly. But eventually, they're going to get to the point where higher prices were consistent with incomes, and we're not going to see the price gains that we saw at that point, uh, especially since it's been hard to get around the income requirements because uh, underwriting conditions are, are tougher. Uh, there's no question about that. It's just simply more difficult to get a home mortgage than it was uh, um, several years ago. You know, one of the things that, uh, when we look at the, the, the housing market, what we've seen a bigger rebound in is the uh, multifamily housing. The single family housing that's really held back some of these uh, um, these numbers. And that's probably a number of factors, both demand uh, for the product that, that some people are now a little bit more hesitant to buy into that market than they were. And, and uh, then, of course, the, the, just the ability to finance those mortgages. And it's not clear that that market is, is, is rebounding uh, particularly quickly uh, uh, throughout the US. And yeah, Robert Schiller uh, was talking uh, on CNBC, I believe, uh, a couple of days ago, talking about the uh, uh, homeownership rate in the country, 
which when it peaked in 04, I believe it was 69%. But that was a heck of a run up to get you to 69%. Home ownership, and that was part of the reason we had a, our, our financial crisis was too many people were getting into homes that really probably should have been renting. And now it's back down to 64% home ownership. So that does take some of that demand off. And some of it is uh, what he called urbanization, where if you live in a city like Portland, uh, do you really need to go and buy a house today? If you have student loans, you might not be able to do anyway. But if you need to go buy a house, do you want to go buy a house? Is that your lifestyle? And more and more apartments are being built, and you need to own a car. And see, like Portland, you can ride your bike. You can get uh, what are they, smart cars or zip cars? Zip cars, thank zip you. Cars. When you need a car, you can do that. And um, so maybe you have a trend going where it's going to take a while for the housing to really pick up again in some of the major cities. I don't know if that necessarily applies to Central Oregon, uh, if that's going to be the case here or not. Right. And I, I, I would also add on to that that you're seeing a demographic change too, where the, the millennials are now just starting to hit their 20s uh, and move into their higher income earning years, or hopefully move into their higher income earning years. Uh, and as that happens, you know, I think they'll end up having more demand for housing, but some of that's just going to be pushed off um, uh, 10, years, 10 years from now. And I tend to think this market will remain largely um, uh, a single family kind of market. Of course, you'll end up with multifamily projects, but I, don't, I think that in migration, uh, being a driver of growth, that most of your mi in migrants will still demand that product, that single family product. And we're seeing that um, uh, emerge. Now, of course, uh, you know, if you look at, the, at this chart, which is residential building permits in this county um, before and after the recession, you see that big run up that Mark was talking about uh, on, the, on the US basis. Uh, and we, we're starting to approach what I'd say was the average permits before that run up. Uh, we're not quite there yet, uh, but we're certainly moving in that direction. And we're off to the bottom, right? Because we had zero permits for a while, or something close to zero. So you know, that had to be the bottom. Uh, uh, I know a little bit about math. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, the amount of activity uh, really going on compared to what we had just a couple of years ago has, has, has been um, uh, pretty rapid, uh, honestly. And, you know, so, you, so you've got actual questions now about whether or not we have the, the construction laborers right now in the state, you know, the, the, to, to help fuel some of this demand uh, that we're starting to see uh, in, in many parts of the state, I think. And prior, like, we're seeing the construction workers, but there have been other areas in the economy where there are not qualified workers as well. Um, no, that's true. The, the energy sector, if you were a welder, skilled welder, experienced, and you want to move to Texas, you can make 175000 a year uh, by moving to Texas as a welder because there isn't enough supply of construction workers and you know, things that we haven't had a lot of growth in over uh, periods of time. The problem for some of those workers in the energy sector today, you're not seeing it yet, but capital expenditures in the energy sector, oil prices remain lower, longer, $80 or below. You'll start to see projects in, in the energy sector dropping off as well. Not as much capital expenditure. So uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out as we go along. But yeah, that's, we need more trained individuals in the areas. And who knows how many of our construction workers here that were here 10 years ago are now wandering around North Dakota or Texas. So um, um, this market, as I alluded to earlier, if we look at job growth, uh, you know, that's, uh, this, I'm kind of wondering if this is what I, I, was, I always like this chart, but it might be arguably a little bit confusing. Uh, for Bend, I'm looking at the uh, lower uh, left-hand corner, uh, and what, what you're seeing there is a comparison of all the, the major metro areas in, in Oregon uh, over this recovery, and in every case, Portland is the red line. So Portland really did um, recover a lot more quickly than we saw other places recover in the state. Uh, it's a bigger economy, more diversity in the economy, uh, and the you know, reality is that as this economy, this recovery has progressed, it's benefited larger metro areas nationwide, not just in, in, in Oregon. Uh, the, the, this region had a longer, uh, you know, a longer path back to getting some growth, which we finally saw start to see I think the last time I was here, you know, two years ago, is when I said, hey, by the way, look, these numbers are starting to turn around, and I anticipate that they're going to continue, and, and they have. Uh, so now, uh, you know, past uh, year and year two, the Central Oregon region has really been adding jobs at a faster pace than anywhere else in the state. 
Uh, and to me, that's really a sign that some of those positive dynamics that we've seen in the past, that inflow of migration, that desire to live in, in Central Oregon has been kicking back into uh, um, uh, kicking back into action and supporting the regional economy. Now, it's certainly nothing like what we saw during the bubble, but you know that's a that's a long that's that's ancient history at this point. You know, we're we're, we're sort of re, uh, readjusting these economies to a post bubble era, and, and I think it will be a healthier growth um, in the long run. Certainly, yeah. as long as uh, uh, interest rates don't go up too much to affect the housing affordability, more people will be able to move to Central Oregon and the, the housing should remain that's, stronger in that period of time. No, that's right. It's, if the, the, it's, it's not likely the, the interest rates, in my opinion, are going to spike up ahead of the economy. And that's one thing I think people kind of forget about when we have these kinds of conversations is to the extent that interest rates are going to rise, they're going to rise after we start seeing some stronger wage growth, for example. And there will be a, a, you know, a different equilibrium, but I think that will sustain this activity for, um, uh, for, for I, I anticipate it for, for a couple years now. Uh, <clears throat> early on in the region, you know, leisure and hospitality was one of the first areas to recover. And I see national, nationally uh, uh, this happened as well. But I did want to point out that in the last uh, two years we're seeing uh, I think that, that that activity brought it out, and we're seeing things. So, for example, in professional and um, business services, the reason that I, we pay attention, or economists often pay attention to sectors like that, is that it's a higher wage sector, uh, and probably also reflects the migration of um, technical skilled workers uh, coming into the area and, and supporting local technology companies, for example, uh, and moving in in in, an air, in a direction that I think is again. Uh, adding more diversity to the economy and saying, you know, we're past just being um, a, a housing market or moving beyond leisure and hospitality, so we're spreading into other fields. And I think, again, that's going to be healthier for, for the region's long run growth. Well, with my home in Sun River and seeing that top line with the uh, leisure and hospitality, big time in Sun River. So that's kind of my barometer that I look at. And obviously, uh, all of Central Oregon. And I thought it was interesting that COVA is moving their headquarters out to, uh, to Sun River. And I don't know if anyone is here from COVA, but I'd be interested to talk with them uh, about that. Uh, but boy, that is in the thick of it. Has anyone here tried to go to Sharp since they opened it? I mean, tried to. It's, it's been absolutely insane. Being a homeowner, they now have an express lane for homeowners. I don't know if you heard that or not. And the North Pool is only for homeowners. So I don't have to go fight you know, all the crabs, and if I do, I can get through the express lane out there, Shark. But it is, it's just an indicator of, of the recovery that's going on in Central Oregon and people wanting to be here. I haven't seen the statistics from this last summer and how much people are spending. I know the previous summers, if people were coming back to Central Oregon, they might not have been spending as much money. They're here, they're on the bike trails, they're doing things, but they might not have been playing the top end golf courses. They might not have been eating out as often at, at the nice restaurants that I've been putting something on the Barbie in the backyard, but getting the people back is the first step. Getting the rentals and the, and the revenues off of that, the tax dollars off of the rentals, back into the uh, economy. And I think that trend is going to continue as well, barring any kind of a, a, a sell-off in, in the economy, basically. Yeah, that, you, you mentioned trends, certainly I've noticed, but I've seen the expansion of um, uh, you know, leisure and hospitality opportunities, especially in restaurants. You know, in, in throughout much much of Oregon, you see that expansion happen maybe at, at, at a lower price point than you might have seen during the bubble. Uh, that there has been a shift in attitudes and, and consumption behavior. And this is also possibly because some of the, the baby boomers are aging out of the workforce in this out of their higher income earning years. Uh, uh, so you know, it's not that we're returning rapidly back to the old days, but we're just moving back and and I think again more positive and in a healthy uh, direction. Uh, well, this is a subset of the uh, uh, professional business services, and that narrows it down to the professional, scientific, and technical services. Uh, so, the more most technically um, uh, um, most technically uh, skilled uh, part of this uh, this sector, and you can see where that's you now now back up above its old peaks, and we're really adding jobs um, uh, in those skilled sectors and picking up some of that pace that we saw again prior to. Uh, 
uh, prior to the recession, we had a big boom in the late 1990s and, and two, early 2000s. Uh, and now we're, uh, you know what? I'm looking at that and my recession shading lines are off. I think that, that was a, uh, a bit of an error. Um, but in any event, we're back up over the peaks that we saw during the, uh, uh, before the recession. So again, a signal that the region's economy is, is continuing to improve beyond uh, what we thought some of the, the basics of the, the, the region was um, maybe 10 years ago. Well, and on that chart, how many years ago was it that Bend was a timber town? Anyway, hard to remember that. For probably a lot of people here, actually. Um, and then, we had the, the, the real estate boom and, and people coming into vacation here, but how do you smooth that out? In, in managing a portfolio, you reduce the risk by having diversification. Diversifying the employment base and then is so important. And a couple weeks ago, we had actually more than this many people in the Ben Venture Conference. So anyone go to that? I know Dino's in the room here today, and I'll round the number up. A million dollars was basically invested in these kind of jobs in the Bend area or in Central Oregon. Uh, and that's the kind of thing you need to get. And a million dollars is by far the largest investment by a, a venture conference in the state of Oregon. <coughs> Nothing in the valley compares to that. And so that's exciting that that's going on and that's going to create those kind of jobs you know, that, that Bend Research has that, you know, higher paying jobs. Uh, they're going to be people who stay here. They're not going to move. They're going to raise their families here. Those are, to me, exciting kind of opportunities. I'm thrilled to see the Venture Conference. And next year, you know, wherever you are, I mean, let's get that to a million and a half, two million if we can, and build the drop job structure and bend, because those are the jobs that are really going to make this work. The other thing, I was in uh, Boulder, Colorado, watching, actually, Oregon State won a Pac-12 game. I think it's the one Pac-12 game they won in the last nine Pac-12 games. Go Beavers. Go Beavers. Um, we were talking about the World Series. I wanted Kansas City because being a Beaver fan, I always love underdogs. So I, I really wanted the Royals to win that game last night. Um, but being in Boulder, what have you got? You've got mountains, you've got outdoor activities, the bikers are everywhere, you have skiing 20 minutes away, you kind of go on and on and on. What else do you have there? A major university. And you look at property values around universities, whether it's Boulder or Corvallis, and what happens to property values around universities that attract high paying professional jobs and crank out students that will work at Bend Research or be involved with these other companies? You know, property values go up. So not only will Cascades Campus add 1,250 new jobs, or 1,250 new students and 150 new full time jobs, not to mention jobs constructed. Every one of those additional students is going to spend about $11,000 in the community, not at the university. It's going to be buying a new bike. It's going to be getting their car repaired. It's going to be groceries. It's going to be clothes. It will be, I mean, what do kids spend? Maybe some beer. <laughs> uh, Tim and I did some, uh, some research <laughs> well, there's beer last there. night. There's good beer here. Did you know that? Tim had never uh, tried the worthy stout. <laughs> I think Worthy, they better shift their brewing capacity to Worthy Stout for the next month now that Tim has discovered the Worthy Stout. So. The, the nice thing, too, about the, the, the College of the Cascades is there's opportunities for growth. It's, a, it's not just going to be 1,200 students forever, um, you know, executed properly and sustained well, assuming we sustain enough uh, young people coming into the pipeline. Uh, that should that should be a number that grows over time. So it's not a one-time pop, but it's something that should build and build and build in, in the community. And you know, that's a that's not just a, a one one-year growth plan or five-year growth plan. That's more like a twenty-year growth plan or longer. So yeah. uh, having that kind of presence, I think, is is sustain will sustain these numbers um, and and also make the, the the region again just one more um, uh, level of attractiveness higher. So I think that's, that's a bright spot for yeah, long term. Right. Higher paying jobs, more jobs, and creating people that will create jobs. Right. Uh, educating people will create jobs in the community. And speaking of uh, uh, the, the, those jobs being created, it's, there's been some concern whether or not the people will be there for those jobs. So this is this, a chart I got from the uh, Office of Economic Analysis out of Salem. <laughs> Fred and Josh Lehner put it together. 
uh, and it shows the, uh, the, the projections for, for the uh, size of the working age population, the blue line, and the per percentage point change where we expect that, 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 that it's heading over the next uh, couple of decades. And the official population statistics are pointing toward uh, a decline in the working age population in Oregon. This has been uh, I think something of a concern in some quarters. I have been fairly less concerned uh, fairly less concerned because my argument when I see this is that, well, if the jobs are here, I've got to believe that people will come to chase those jobs, right? Is that, you know, that, that, that Oregon as an overall, uh, overall has, uh, uh, you know, in my opinion, a top quality of life and, and will draw uh, immigrants if the jobs are here. And if the immigrants come, I think that will foster additional job growth. So I've, I see a, a, a much better equilibrium than perhaps uh, one would get from, from this particular chart. Uh, but it's certainly something out there. We do have to be cognizant that we do need in migrants to uh, continue to fuel the, the labor markets here. Uh, so the doors have to remain open uh, for those people to come. And there's demographic statistics. Every woman in here is a winner because the new life expectancy just came out and women increased their life expectancy by 2.2 years to 88.8, or maybe it was 2.4 years. And men will increase their life expectancy by two years. So congratulations, you're winners. <laughs> but men are winners because if you're, and that's if you're 65 years old. If you're 65 years old, the odds of a woman needing long-term health care is 73%. And the odds of a man needing long-term health care is 58%. So we get a, an attaboy if we come in second place on the airplane. That's because we die sooner. Well, we die sooner. That's not part of it. We don't need to take a longer view. Right? So we're losing the blue grass. I apologize. But the other part, point that our friends at Wells Fargo did a study that I just saw recently talking about how much have people saved. And I'm not going to have people raise their hands on this because this room I know is different. But there's a huge percentage of people who have no savings and the average for the middle class, middle income person who's like 50 years old, I believe is $20,000, something like that. And, and someone at Wells could probably cite those statistics better than me. So when we look at this and say, okay, we're gonna get in migration, but we're also gonna have people in, in Oregon and in the US, we're gonna have to keep working longer. And so that's gonna have an impact on, you know, how the job growth comes into play over the years. So that's right, and, and employers might have to adjust to that. And make arrangements for those workers to work longer uh, um, in their in their lives. Uh, so I think that will play into maybe sustaining the workforce more than we currently, uh, more than some of these more pessimistic population numbers would uh, suggest. It's, you know, it's, it was one thing to retire at, at you know, 60 when your life expectancy was fairly low, but you know, it becomes a little bit more difficult now to you know, figure out what to do with those next 20 or 30 years, uh, especially if you don't have the income or the savings. and the financial markets aren't kicking out a good enough return to live on the, maybe the savings we have, right? That would be another concern. So along those lines, though, I, I did want to point out that uh, you know, we would, would you know, one of the, the benefits that Pacific Northwest is uh, apparently expected to be uh, uh, climate refugees is that to the extent that much of the West could in fact uh, experience severe droughts as climate change occurs, that presumably they would they would search out where water is, and we were hoping that that would be the Pacific Northwest. So we would see those climate refugees, which means that we have to continue to pray for rain. This drought was a little bit longer and spread a little bit too far north for my uh, uh, my tastes uh, in that uh, in that area. So uh, the rain we're seeing is good stuff, and uh, hopefully we can we can keep that uh, trend moving. And there was just an article in the New York Times. Sacramento, which is kind of the bullseye on that uh, chart for uh, drought. Most of the people in Sacramento just pay a flat rate, residential users pay, pay a flat rate for their water. So go ahead, water as much as you want. Uh, by far the majority of the water goes for farming. Right. And, and that's going to become more of an issue as we go along. Will that put pressure on inflation for agricultural products? And again, in this room, middle income, 
you know, if the price of milk goes up or the price of cereal goes up or it stays the same and they put it in a much smaller box, have you seen that game? I just, and I saw a reason where Campbell's Soup was talking about making smaller cans of soup, same price. People didn't need to eat as much. They no, eat no. More, so. uh, but there is definitely a segment of the population where price of, price of gasoline goes up, price of food goes up. That's a much bigger part of their budget than it would be for you know, most people in this room. And so inflation, while it is not very set, in fact, most agricultural commodities uh, have seen their, their uh, pricing going down over the last year or two. Um, at some point, that could become an issue for uh, a lot of individuals. Yeah. It's, it's the funny thing about inflation, it doesn't have to affect everybody equally, right? It's right. Like, is that you know, when the government puts out that number, it's 2% or 1.7% you know, year over year growth in, in prices, but nobody ever actually experiences that. Some people experience an inflation rate that's lower, and many people experience inflation rates that's higher. And, uh, you know, that I think is often a missing part. If you sort of pick out individual elements and match them to individual budgets, then you, you, you would have to find the, the individual's true inflation rate uh, in the background. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you can about inflation. Yeah, the next gauge, <laughs> the next big gauge on the Fed's dashboard. First one was unemployment, second one was inflation. And the Fed would love to see 2% inflation, and we're not getting it, as you can see by this chart. The CPI has declined, and, and again, the Fed is targeting about 2%, but we're close. And the new language the Fed came out with yesterday is um, inflation in the near term will be held down by energy, but the likelihood of sub 2% inflation has diminished. So, uh, it's funny listening to the talking heads on the news yesterday talking about what a historic day this was with the Fed yesterday. You know, dropping QE and coming out with these, whether they're more hawkish or less dovish types of statements that we are going to have inflation, we feel good, the job growth is going to be on track, and underutilization. It's kind of a historic day, but when you look at it, you know, we still don't have a lot of inflation in place. And if you're as old as me, you remember what inflation was like. And we have a generation that grew up looking over our shoulders for the next inflation, and now we're not getting it. So that is a concern for the Fed. And even though they dropped the quantitative easing, uh, and basically said they won't do it. Let's see, could that change at some point in time? 7% seven percent's our, seven percent our unemployment rate target we're shooting for. Wait, we meant six and a half. No more QE, but if you see inflation drop, uh, that could be a concern. And you might think, well, inflation can't drop, but look at other countries around the world. Look at the European Union, look at the United Kingdom and Japan. They are afraid, they're definitely afraid of deflation in those countries. They're trying to think of things they can do. So that is a big risk we have in the global economy today, is that they drift into a, more of a deflationary environment in those countries. Europe today has, I saw them, about $1.1 trillion of debt, which is 9% of their GDP. And if you have debt, excuse me, $1.1 trillion is a bad debt. Thank you. Uh, and if you have debt and you have inflation, you're going to pay it off every year with cheaper dollars. If you have deflation, it's harder to pay off debt in that kind of a situation. So Europe is very concerned. And when we look at the U.S., we have the Federal Reserve and the Treasury and Congress, and, and they try and get together and do things. In Europe, how many different countries are in the EU? Germany's economy is very different than Spain's or Portugal's, and, and you're trying to get everyone to get consensus to, we've got to do this, you know. And Draghi, the head of the uh, ECB, keeps saying that, you know, we'll do whatever it takes, we'll do whatever it takes. But if the, the German 10-year bond is at 0.9%, and we're at 23 today, and we try to push our interest rates down, what if the ECB pushes interest rates down, the European Central Bank pushes interest rates down to 0.8? for Germany. People can go out and buy more cars, homes, and so they're, they're really in kind of a bind, and that is one of the, the global economic situations we need to keep our eye on uh, as far as how the U.S. is going to grow. So <laughs> it's definitely a case that when the Federal Reserve sees these numbers, they're not going to be any great rush to raise interest rates, and they are definitely watching the, the, the disaster that's unfolding in Europe right now, just the inability to manage policy in such a way as to keep uh, activity up. Uh, and it is, uh, it does raise those fears of those sort of debt deflation cycle, uh, spirals. And I, I don't 
want to you know emphasize the negative here on this because there are I, I think those trade channels are, are fairly um, uh, fairly tame uh, really between the U.S. and Europe and certainly produce some producers will be affected etc. But uh, I you know what I really do though worry about is there's some financial contagion at some point down the line. Uh, now, you know, again, we've seemed to have insulated the systems a little bit more than over four years ago, but it's certainly something that's that's on my horizon. So this must be more deflation somewhere. Uh, well, no, this is actually China. China. <laughs> you, you probably did anyone watch 60 Minutes when they had the ghost cities of China? Uh, and if you haven't, you probably read about it. You heard about it. Basically, there are cities that just you know go on and on that they built, and no one's ever moved in. So they've had a real estate bubble that they put in place in China. And what's interesting this morning, their GDP dropped again to 7.3%, which is very low for them. Uh, and they've talked about putting stabilization back into the housing investment, basically, for uh, residential real estate. And so they're fighting the battle. They've got a real estate bubble, evidenced by cities that were built. Uh, and they have a huge investment. That's how their economy grew. Their economy grew by building infrastructure. And that really helped the United States as we got out of our financial crisis because we could start exporting raw materials or elevators or equipment or caterpillar machinery to China as they were doing this massive build. They want to shift to a more consumer-based economy and that's slowing things down as they do that, but they, they built too much because they went along. And so now they have a problem. How do they not let their economy drop too much, but they don't want to provide stu too much stimulus at the same time. And Tim's going to tell me I'm being negative again. But <laughs> but the United States today has the strongest economy in the world. Sometimes it might not feel that way, and a third of the population feels like we're still in a recession, which yeah, I'm not sure how, how that happens. But unless you're one of those jobless ones, underutilized, um, you know, members of our uh, community. but. Um, you know, there are parts of the world, we're the strongest, there are parts of the world, China being one of them, second largest economy, where there are some concerns about where it's going to head. So tell me the bright side of that. No, the, the, <laughs> the bright side is, though, the U.S. is uh, a, a stable engine of growth in that, uh, in that environment. Uh, that Europe has had a challenge getting their act together, Japan has had a challenge getting their act together. Uh, the, the Chinese economy is, is transitioning, and that's a challenge for them. Uh, and you know, it, it's it's of course we haven't bounced back to the kinds of growth we saw prior to the recession. Uh, we haven't bounced back to the kinds of growth we saw in the 1990s either. Uh, but certainly, if you look across the globe, uh, there's more, there's a reason why we have interest rates that are high <laughs> um, compared to Europe, and that's because it is a, a stronger economy. Right. Uh, and and that is uh, a, certainly a generally optimistic story, I think. Then we look at, uh, again, China, again, just graphically showing that uh, as they're trying to get their economy going, you can see where their, their growth is declining. And that's one of the reasons, when you look at the price of, at the pump today, I guess, that the price has come down. Oil prices, not very, few months ago, not very many months ago, were about $104 a barrel, West Texas Intermediate. Today, I think it's down a buck to $81 again this morning. And part of that is a reduced uh, demand out of Asia, and, uh, excuse me, out of Asia and China in particular, which had been pretty much sopping up all the, the energy supplies and out trying to find more for the last decade. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why oil prices are, are declining. If you're a conspiracy person. I like a good conspiracy. Kind of a conspiracy. Uh, is it, you know, <clears throat> one of the geopolitical risks obviously is Ukraine and and Russians going up to the border there <clears throat> excuse me and uh, Russia is very dependent on oil as part of their economy they're a resource-based economy so what if the US and OPEC said we're gonna drive oil prices down Saudi Arabia by the way is not backing off on their oil production right. Venezuela needs more oil production the lower price of oil goes the more they need to generate oil to keep their economy going uh, what if oil prices are being driven down to punish the Russians? That's a pretty strong sanction. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that the Russians are noticing it, uh, I don't know if it's in the bulletin of the Oregonian, but go to the Wall Street Journal today. 
In the last two days, the Russians have had more flights of their bombers and fighters pushing right up to European airspace. More of that occurred since the Cold War. And it's happened in the last two days. And Putin came out a couple days ago, basically just said, the US is the devil. They're trying to take over the world, be the strong bully. And uh, so there are geopolitical risks out there. <coughs> flip, it, flip it to the other side. What are you paying for gas, you know, regular gas bake, 320? Um, what a kicker for the U.S. economy that is. For consumers going into Christmas and looking at how much more right, will be in the average person's pocket to spend at Christmas this year. Right. So lower, low, excuse me, lower oil prices are negative for the oil industry, but 80 bucks is not too, too bad yet. It's very negative for Russia. But for the United States, that's another big plus sign for the U.S. consumer, which is still 70% of our economy. So, and it's a big plus for the consumers that are most um, income constrained. Uh, those are the group that have the highest energy costs and they'll get the biggest boost from them. And so you can see some of that spending uh, kick out a little bit more quickly as a result of that. So, you know, on net, it will be a positive for the US economy. Um, and then and Putin did say a couple weeks ago too that uh, oil at $80 threatens to collapse the global economy, which I, I think he meant to say 80, Oil at eighty dollars threatens to collapse the Russian economy. I think that's what he meant to say. Yeah. Uh, but you know that that is a, a concern, and so that speaks to the, the conspiracy theory. Of, of, although we do seem to be pumping a lot of oil, and consumer behavior did change in response to high prices. So it, it could be that, that we do see sustained um, price declines, and that would be a positive energy shock for the U.S. And, and not just for the consumer, but for uh, the industry as well. So for the first time in. 30 plus years, Tim probably remembers exactly how long when he, when he looks at this, we started seeing manufacturing jobs coming back to the US. We would expect that to continue because the price of our natural gas is about a third of what it would be in Asia or in Europe today, rough numbers, a third. And so you're able to bring manufacturing back to the US, partly it's gonna be technology, but partly because of such a low cost of our natural gas, which is a basic feedstock of a lot of different things, plastics. Uh, fertilizers, uh, you know, there's a number of things that natural gas will affect uh, just running a plant. And so you're seeing manufacturing growing. Now we did this for 35 years and we bought it out. Now we're only coming back in tiny steps, but it's a positive for U.S. industry as well with uh, gas prices that low. Right, and, and uh, uh, you don't want to oversell that as you noted though, because the jobs that are coming back are highly productive jobs. And we're, what it takes one worker and a piece of capital to do now is what maybe took 10 workers you know, 40 years ago. So uh, the direction's right, but the, the, the industry's fundamentally changed. But at least we're not losing we're jobs. We're not losing jobs right. anymore right now, exactly, exactly. So we put this one in here. Uh, this was net wealth for households and nonprofits, and you can see where we're, uh, we've certainly rebounded in wealth um, uh, compared to the recession. There was a huge hit between stock prices going down and house prices going down uh, that knocked the, the wind out of the sales out of, out of household wealth uh, and, and presumably consumers as well. And the stock market rebound, uh, the improvement in housing prices, and uh, really a, a decline in mortgage debt too, as, as some people got their debt erased through bankruptcy or foreclosure, have all contributed to bringing this net wealth number, net worth number uh, uh, back up. I don't know that we're seeing that translate into a lot of consumer spending now. And that might really reflect the uh, um, disparities of wealth uh, that, that the people where some of these numbers are most contributing to, uh, particularly via stock price appreciation, are, are with the wealthier, uh, less income constrained uh, consumers to begin with. Uh, so, but it also raises some interesting questions about what's the, you know, every time we've reached these kind of peaks, unpleasantness has followed, shall we say. Uh, and uh, to what extent will then the next recession have some element of, of this, this wealth effect built into it? One of, the, one of the positives that will help mitigate that effect though is that the U.S. consumer has been deleveraging their balance sheet for the last six or seven years. I mean, people have less debt. Part of it came through foreclosure, but you know, anecdotally I've talked with people when rates were 3% or 4%, well, low 4%, whatever, refinanced. And when they did that, I know people who might have paid down part of their mortgage so that, you know, took, took a 30-year 30, 30 mortgage at a higher rate 
refinanced at 15%, paid part of it down. So they're basically paying the same amount on now 15 year mortgage instead of the 30. And people were reducing their credit card debt for a while as well. So to help <clears throat> offset, if we do have another financial problem that, that would arise, at least today, people aren't gonna be in the kind of a, a backup in credit situation that they were before, other than student loans. That is the one sector, and I mentioned it earlier, but that's the one sector in the, in the consumer debt area that has seen tremendous growth. Uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, we were at 250 billion, and today we're 1.1 trillion of student loan debt. And, and that's something that's gonna have to be addressed. Uh, so I'll put a plug in for COCC on that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do think that the, the main point of, of, of being on average less leveraged is, is pretty important. I mean, if you're too worried about this because of the recession uh, possibility, you have to remember that one of the reasons this, this past recession was so um, uh, difficult was because of the amount of leverage built into the system. Uh, and we don't have that kind of leverage uh, with, with the consumer end anymore, with, with the exception of the household, oh, excuse me, the, the, the um, uh, uh, the student debt, but that's even a different kind of, of, of leverage too. There's no physical asset on the other side of that to be taken away. Um, so uh, you know, I, this is an interesting number and I, it's not as scary to me as it might have been right. uh, um, four or five years ago. And, and there is a concentration of wealth more this time than there was in those previous periods, Zuckerberg and people like that. Um, but there's still a, a leverage factor in that. And I don't know what it is today compared to previous cycles where when people are worth more, they're willing to go out and spend more. Uh, whether it's your home or your portfolio. So the person who has a 20,000 401k, maybe it's worth 24,000 today, a couple years later. Uh, but people have portfolios, they've gone up. And there is a leverage factor in that as we hit these new highs in the network. Mm, yeah, that's, it, it, it's, it's, what I thought was interesting with the housing bubble is that that was definitely something where housing prices went up, people could borrow into that, and that probably fueled consumer spending. And people don't borrow as much against their stock portfolio. And so that asset price appreciation probably doesn't yield generally the kinds of, of wealth effect that we saw in, in the home bubble, uh, home price bubble. And so that might be, again, one of those reasons why consumer spending numbers have not bounced back as much as, uh, even though stock prices are up. Is, you know, and as you mentioned, the concentration of wealth, again, that, that wealth effect will most intensely hit those that are less constrained to begin with. Right. So, so we've talked about the unemployment improving. We've talked about inflation being very much in check and in parts of the world that won't be affected totally by the Fed funds right here, but in parts of the world, they're actually worried about deflation. Quantitative easing is off the table now. So the next question for the Fed is, what will they look at and when will they start raising short-term interest rates? And again, in their, in their new language, they just said they're gonna be looking at you know, growth. How is our economy going to grow? Uh, and will they keep rates lower longer? And those little dots that you see on that chart, those are the Fed's forecasts for where they're gonna be. Um, and when they start raising rates. And again, this chart might be outdated now as well, uh, after yesterday. And then the, the blue line down below it is basically Fed funds futures, or what the market is saying. And, and when you look at that chart, the market is saying that maybe, so market agrees with the Fed as far as when they'll start raising rates, uh, but not to the extent that the Fed is predicting today because the market is looking at lower inflation and continued slower growth, I believe. Yeah, no, and, and if, if this chart you know, changed, it's because the blue line's probably shifted down over the past couple of weeks because suddenly people started to say, wait a second, you know, is growth going fast enough? Is inflation fast enough for, for the Fed to uh, um, uh, proceed with, I think, I think the general sense within the Federal Reserve is that they're going to try to um, lift off the zero bound high rates in the middle of 2015. Uh, and, and people have been questioning that given some of the, the inflation actually given the uh, decline in oil prices and the presumption of what that was going to do for inflation. Uh, but uh, it's clear that there's still that disconnect between what I think fed, um, uh, monetary policymakers believe and what um, uh, financial markets believe. And you know, to the extent that financial markets have been more right about this than, than, 
um, monetary policymakers is, is an issue, but it could also be a communication issue too, where the Fed's not really getting its story across. Um, I think that, uh, again, people don't think that you're gonna start to see wage growth or very much caught up in this unemployment, uh, underemployment, underutilization story. I'm more optimistic that you know, what's gonna happen over the next six months is we're gonna see that yeah, the, the economy is continuing to improve and it's not going gangbusters, but we're seeing the, the, the kinds of signals the Fed needs to start to try to normalize policy. One, one other comment just on that chart, and you don't need to leave that one up there because it's, it's a similar kind of a chart, but it, it has to do with the quantitative easing. I had someone ask me recently, wow, they went from 85 billion a month in, in bond purchases, and, and a number of those were treasuries. They were 15 billion, they phased down to 15 billion, and now it's gone. Who's gonna buy our treasuries? Go back five, six years ago, our deficit for the federal government, so in one year, they borrowed 1.3 or 1.4 yes. trillion. Today, uh, the, the government's fiscal year end, federal government's fiscal year end is September, so the number that came out for September 30th was $486 billion of deficit. So there aren't as many bonds to buy. No, we're not printing as many bonds to start with. And the demand is still high from, from investors is that um, to even a 30 year debt is there seems to be, whenever, whenever rates move back up toward 3% on the 10 year and a little bit longer on the 30 year, there seems to be investors come out of the woodwork to snag that stuff up. Uh, so right now there hasn't been uh, you know, you know, any cause to think that there's going to be some radical spike in interest rates that uh, um, we should be worried about. You know, one thing that I, I would like to you know, emphasize, the Fed likes to emphasize that even as they start to um, reduce financial accommodation, even as they start to raise interest rates, that they expect that the interest rates will still will be much lower than would be normally associated with the levels of unemployment and inflation that we're seeing. And so that you know, monetary accommodation then will still be pretty loose going forward. And so you know, this chart shows those black dots are essentially the dots that uh, Mark had on his previous charts where these are the expected path of the, the federal funds rate. Uh, and then the, 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 all the other lines are different measures of appropriate monetary policy that, that have been developed, different tailored rules um, if, you're, if you're into this, this stuff. Uh, that would suggest that the appropriate level of, of, of tightening is actually uh, much more than we've seen so far. And so the Fed is anticipating that they do not rush headlong into uh, uh, tighter policy and have no real reason to. And this speaks well for the longevity of this re re um, recovery um, uh, going forward. Do you want to add anything to that? No, that's good. Okay. So let's just talk about the dollar, what's going on. Uh, if you want to go to Europe, probably not a bad time to go right now because the euro this morning was below 126. I remember um, when it was like 96. Yeah, right after it first came out. That was the time of the year. You all should have done that. We should have had this meeting in France back then. Um, but again, this gets back to the dollar strengthening because the U.S. is actually looking at raising rates. If everything goes according to plan, we will be raising our rates. And the dollar is strengthening. Uh, this, this chart actually shows it against uh, emerging market currencies, but again, it's the same thing against Europe, because their economy is not as strong as it could be either. This is another one of the reasons for oil prices declining. One was China slowing down, but a stronger dollar, because oil is basically valued in dollars, as the dollar strengthens, the price of oil in the U.S. goes down as well. So it's, it's another positive there for us uh, in that regard. Uh, and until these other countries, China, Japan, and uh, the European Union really start turning their economies around, we would expect the dollar to continue to strengthen. And, and that's a good sign, it's positive, keeps it, uh, commodity prices in check. Here's the downside, I always have to throw that out. Every sword cuts two ways. The downside to this is for US manufacturers to sell offshore, it's more expensive. So you might have the best product, but if you have a competitor in Japan that makes pretty close product or in Germany, and the, they're gonna get this price differential opening up between the US product, which is gonna become more expensive in Europe or in Japan, uh, it, it becomes an issue for US companies. 
So third quarter earnings are being reported right now. We're probably a little more than halfway through third quarter earnings. They're very, kind of very positive for U.S. companies. Uh, and we expect that trend to continue. But you're starting to see infiltrating into the company's announcements about forward-looking earnings, the, the risk of, the, the companies that have big international exposure, the risk of earnings being affected by that. So when we look at this chart, we'll tell you that we believe U.S. companies are still going to grow going forward. Uh, we love the U.S. market right now, as a matter of fact. Um, but it's kind of look over your shoulder at that one a little bit. What could happen if the dollar strengthens too much? And that's going to happen because the dollar will strengthen a lot more if these other economies just don't get their acts together. Right. No, that's, that's so true. And, and one thing that actually is actually keeping the dollar a little bit weaker and the euro a little bit stronger is they've been fairly slow to uh, loosen monetary policy. If I didn't see one of, the, one of the big calls that I missed over the past several years was how strong the euro was going to get given how much of a mess the regional economies were. And, and the reason is that uh, uh, relative to the U.S., they were maintaining a policy that was just far too tight and keeping the euro stronger. And now we're starting to see some of that reverse as the U.S. Uh, improves. Uh, and that, you know, that, that does cut two ways. There's a big general equilibrium story going on, and one of the equilibriums or one of the stories is that the U.S. economy is improving in relative terms to the rest of the world. And there's some slowdown effect through those international channels as a result of that going forward. So. Um, it's certainly something to keep an eye on, but again, I, I've been trying to be, you know, fairly positive and think those impacts will be limited. Um, right. uh, that the main driver of U.S. growth is domestic demand, uh, and that will continue to be the case going forward. So we do expect rates to begin oh, going there up. There was something else. Then. Yeah, there was. I was sorry. No, that was. We actually put it in two charts, but that's all right. Um, so we do expect rates to begin going up. Right now, it's June of fifteen. June of 2015, that's kind of yeah, the, expectation. That's the expectation. That's my expectation. Did, did yesterday alter that for you at all? No, no. What, you know, what, what happened over the previous couple of weeks was somehow pre people started really expect it later, like fourth quarter of 2015. And I never really bought into that to begin with. I think that you know they're sending a pretty clear signal that they think on the projected path and data that mid, mid next year is, is the way to go. And they, they did say clearly too, you know, if data changes, will change too. Um, and that can cut both directions. That can cut earlier than later. And you know, I want, I'm not afraid of the, the, um, the rate hike only because I think that that's going to be reflecting positive economic developments in the US. And it's not going to be um, uh, some you know, sudden rate hike that's inconsistent with uh, the changes in the US economy. So I'm hoping that we get that rate hike sooner because it will tell me that conditions are, are improving here pretty quickly. So rates going up, U.S. economy, unemployment's improving, uh, inflation's not a factor, rates will start going up, so where are we in the economic cycle, and how is all this going to play through? Um, you know, people are worried that we've had this great recovery in the market, slower recovery in, in the overall economy and unemployment, but when you look at the last five economic cycles, why is the economy rolled over? It's because the economy is overheated. And we're nowhere to that point right now. Economies you know, don't die of old age. They die because things get overheated. We're nowhere near that point right now. So when we look at uh, this chart on uh, uh, GDP, uh, our expectation is that we can continue to have this growth in the US economy. And that's again why we're, we're positive on, on US stocks is because we think with domestic demand and foreign demand, you know, albeit reduced some, you're still going to have some good foreign demand, and, and if Europe can turn the corner, greater foreign demand that uh, we we think we still have room to grow in this economic cycle that we're in. No, and I I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I think people focus on these recessions. Um, I think people tend to be pessimistic when they should be optimistic, and optimistic when they should be pessimistic. And this is a a time where I sense far too much pessimism for for the stage of the cycle that we're at, and I would say that we're still fairly easy in it. Recessions are fairly rare events. I mean, it's something that, that's forgotten. Since the, the mid 1980s, uh, they happen you know, once every eight, you know, 10 years or something. And there's no reason why this one shouldn't last. It's only five years long. There's no reason it shouldn't last another three, four, five years uh, going forward. Before you get to 
conditions that are um, uh, hot enough to prompt um, sufficient monetary tightening to sort of turn the turn the um, turn the cycle around. Uh, when that happens, it will probably happen quickly, and it will probably be a surprise um, in some 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 shape or form. Not to us, of course. We'll know. Uh, 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 but I've, I've I'm just not worried about these these uh, changes. I have this faith that. Uh, this belief that in the long run it's the supply side of the economy that's fundamentally important. That as long as capital depreciation depreciates the need to be replaced, as long as technology is changing, and as long as babies are being born, as long as those things continue to happen, there's underlying momentum for growth in the economy. It's not going to sort of turn around and, 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 and change. And these recessions are, are really um, uh, temporary deviations from those that are uh, more demand related, but but temporary nonetheless. And uh, oh no, I know what this is. This is the same chart. In a way, this is the same chart because it's my chart. I do remember these, you know, occasionally. I just can't see that far anymore. Um, uh, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, this is another another way of saying it. there's just nothing in the data that would suggest that we're anywhere, you know, close to some kind of recession, which is. A, a per, 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 perpetual fear I see, um, uh, particularly in the financial press, uh, and particularly maybe I'm, I'm seeing people try to sell uh, bearish stock stories as opposed to more, much more bullish story. Uh, but th 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 that we don't see really reason to, to believe in the U.S. data that, that a recession is, is anywhere near um, uh, anywhere near us. And do you have anything to add on that, Mark? You know who's telling a negative story right now? Good. I love this. I saw the headline last night. Alan Greenspan. I saw that. Too. You know what he's recommending you buy? Did gold. you see that? Gold. Yes, gold. And and his reason is we're in uncharted territory with the Fed having a four and a half trillion dollar balance sheet. He goes, this can't end well. This is the guy. You guys remember the Lawrence Welk show? Some of you might. And they blew bubbles. <laughs> I think he was the original bubble blower on the Lawrence Welk show. This guy created more bubbles than anyone in the history of economics. I'm sorry if, if anyone here is related to Alan Greenspan or is like you're drinking, but I apologize for that. But he really, truly helped set the table for the financial crisis. And he's sitting there now looking at what Bernanke did and what Yellen's doing and going, oh my God, we're in trouble, go buy gold. So there, there's someone who is kind of bearish out Yeah, and I, you read that whole article and you kind of wonder how we called this guy the maestro for so long, right? Is that um, there's, there's a huge inconsistency as he begins that talk with, well, quantitative easing hasn't had any real effects, right? And therefore, why would you expect that reversing quantitative easing would have real effects too? Right? It's, yeah. it's, so there's a complete disconnect between, um, uh, I think, you know, the, the, the view on what the policy achieved and the view on what's going to happen as, as we sort of um, uh, pull away from that policy. Uh, and then the, the he must be he must be paid by someone to sell gold or something. Maybe he's not the commissioner, uh, the, 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 the gold people. So uh, I thought that. Oh, and uh, he also has that belief in um, uh, what I call immaculate um, interest, immaculate inflation. Right? Is that you know this belief that inflation is going to suddenly pop out of nowhere, and as a consequence, the Fed's going to have to suddenly tighten interest rates. And I I view that as largely a, a, you know an endogenous process. Is that when economic conditions become uh, sufficiently tight, the Fed will, or sufficiently hot, the Fed will start to raise interest rates, and we should never see inflation above 2.5% in this cycle. Um, and if we get to that 2.5% later on, that'll be overheating, the Fed will over tighten, and then we can have that recession talk maybe in four years. How are we doing on time? We're good. We're good? We're getting close to the end, we want lots of questions. So, uh, uh, Oregon, I, again, I, I'm following the same picture, is that uh, regional data, I think, has been generally positive and consistent with what we're seeing in the U.S. Initial unemployment claims are very low. Firms are not firing workers. Um, I think they're increasingly gearing up for hiring. Uh, temporary help payrolls have been climbing still as firms, uh, again, find more and more need to, to bring on uh, uh, workers. Uh, hours worked for manufacturing, which is the lower left, lower right-hand column, has slowed down a bit, but I think what happened is at the end of 2012, manufacturing firms found themselves short-handed and they're working their shifts pretty heavy, and they've added workers since then, and that's brought down some of those hours. We're still at levels that are very much consistent with um, uh, uh, 
on solid economic cycles. And the one thing that's still holding back is like the U.S. as a whole is that um, uh, you know residential building permits uh, still you know have risen off the bottom but are, are moving sideways, uh, and a lot of that's due to um, multifamily, particularly in the Port Portland area, which is not seeing. The, the, the single family reemerged just like in the rest of the nation. I, I'm not going to say there's something dramatically different going on here um, as far as the cycle uh, is concerned. Uh, and certainly when I put these numbers together in my various indexes, the, all signs point to up. Um, there's nothing that's a, you know, a sustained downtrend that would make you say, you know, oh no, this is turning around uh, quickly. This next chart just shows. Uh, you know, basically what happens to the market when we have uh, tightening cycles like we're headed into. And the, the point would be from this chart, the takeaway would be uh, to the left side of the, of the chart is the six months prior to the, uh, to the rate hike and then the next six months are on the right side of the chart. What you get is increased volatility. You don't necessarily get a, a market sell-off, but you do have more volatility in the market but once you actually have the rate hike take effect, you tend to see an upward trend in the S&P 500. So when they first talked about the taper back in 2013, whenever it was, early 2013, and the market was shocked, interest rates spiked, I mean, it's, you had all kinds of crazy things going on, um, and then it settled down. So I think the Fed has done a nice job getting the economy, getting investors ready for end of, uh, or through the tapering process and NEQE, and now that we're getting towards uh, actual rate hikes, they're happening for the right reasons. And, and that's a good thing. If rates were going up because we were trying to shut down the economy like Volcker did, shut down inflation, different story, but when you look at the previous cycles, uh, what you're finding is rate hikes for the right reasons are not a reason to be concerned about the market. No, I think that's exactly right. Is that in these early stages, there is a lot of uncertainty as the cycle is turning, as the as the uh, monetary policy cycle is turning. But I, you know, as as it's tend to be the case after that initial turn, uh, people start to realize, wait a second, the economy is still growing. Policymakers have some idea of what they're doing. Um, they don't always have an idea of what they're doing. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to say that they're always perfect, but they do. Right now, I think they do. And uh, then you have. Uh, quite a bit of time for these markets to, to still grow as the economy grows with them before again you get that overheating and uh, it's, again we're just not not in that zone. And then we look at valuations for the market. Uh, the blue lower part are uh, corporate earnings and then the green line would be price earnings ratio on a forward PE, forward earnings, price earnings ratio. We don't think the market's overvalued. It's not real cheap by any means, but it's not overvalued, especially if you have growing earnings. And that's what we're going to hang our hat on is corporate America uh, that really did reduce a lot of costs during the, during the recession. And they're, they're still pretty much lean and mean, but they are hiring people on again. Uh, and we think the demand is there in, in, the, in the U.S. and globally. Uh, and we would expect that the market is fairly valued and we think it will continue to go up. You're not going to get another 35% year, but if we end this year up 10%, when you have back-to-back -back strong years like we did in 2012 and 2013, does that mean the market has to go down? No, the average after two strong years like we had in 2012 and 2013 is a 12% market return that following year. Uh, we're probably about 8% right now. And one of the kickers, I don't want to get political, but one of the kickers could be the election might get us that 12% return for the year, depending on the, how the election turns out. Uh, I think that could actually be a positive for the market and, and people's confidence. Uh, so a 12% year would fit with what we've seen in, in previous cycles going back 100 and some years for the stock market when you have back-to-back -back good years. So rates going up doesn't mean it's going to be a problem. Market having done well doesn't mean it's going to be a problem. Look at what corporate America is doing. Look how the consumer is doing. Look at confidence, which are all improving. So we would expect that the market is going to continue to give you some positive growth. Yeah, right. I, I think there's a, a widespread fear that somehow stocks are misvalued because, uh, again, there's some idea that they've been propped up artificially by uh, monetary policy. And, and I don't think that's an accurate description at all because it ignores the increase in profits in the background. Uh, you know, sure, stocks are up, but profits are up enormously since the uh, 
uh, bottom of the recession. I think that's fundamentally the driving force. To the extent that monetary policy has been loose, I think it's more following the um, following the cycle than um, uh, being artificially low. And also, I think the point you made earlier is that quantitative easing has been on the on the downswing for months now, and uh, we haven't seen the you know, stocks roll over. Um, uh, so it's not that it ended yesterday, it's been ending uh, for quite a long time and it hasn't created the, the huge problems in, in activity that, that people might have anticipated, which is exactly as we would expect as we turn these cycles, is that the Federal Reserve gets ahead of these curves, tries to, to reduce financial accommodation, it throws things into a little bit of extra volatility, but you know, as long as the Federal Reserve's not reacting to um, some artificial concern, and they've been very working very hard not to worry about those artificial concerns. I think that speaks well for uh, both the financial markets over the longer term and, and the U.S. economy. So the U.S. is doing well. Where are the risks? We would see the risks really coming from outside of the U.S. Uh, ISIS and what's going on in Iraq and Syria. Uh, does that expand to a broader war? Uh, the Ukraine, we already mentioned. And, Putin's a little bit upset when he's losing his revenues. What's even worse, his oligarch billionaire buddies are losing their revenues. They can't buy any more basketball teams. Ballmer's buying them instead, you know? That's something wrong with that picture. Um, but seriously, there is a little internal uh, headbutting going on in Russia right now with these guys who became billionaires, you know, courtesy of Putin. And they're not happy that the price of oil is dropping, and their net worth is dropping. Um, but that is an issue with Ukraine, although right now it's, it's apparently backed off a little bit. Uh, China, if they can't manufacture this soft landing, which they're trying to do now, I think that's one of the biggest economic risks. And then the other one would be just if, if Europe can't get their act together. And I, I think that's more of, a, more of a gradual decline. I'm not sure how you feel on those two. No, and, and what I, I kind of add on to this is those are all, I mean, those are all great stories and, and I, I love them. Um, uh, 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 there's a lot of monetary fiscal policy stuff in there, it's good stuff. Uh, but what I, what I always, again, think about is remembering that the, the fundamental source of, of U.S. growth is U.S. citizens. Um, uh, that, you know, I can remember, I can remember back in 1997, uh, 1998, J.P. Morgan saying the U.S. economy was certainly going to have a recession because the Asian financial crisis was going to knock exports out from under us. And that never evolved in any way, shape, or form. Is that somebody said, I can also remember uh, uh, stories that the global economy would never be the same once Japan you know, slowed down and wasn't able to get its act together again. And that wasn't the case. So I think you know, we, can, we can put too much weight on these external stories um, where uh, the, the globe is a, is a fairly large place and we don't know what other emerging markets going to come along to sort of pull off um, some of the weight. Um, so I, I understand these things are, are risks and they're always something to keep your eye on in the background, uh, but I, I'm not really making a huge change in my forecast on the basis of those. Now if you're in financial markets though, you do want to be somewhat concerned about the volatility that could emerge from those risks even on a, on a short term basis. So, so whereas I'm thinking, you know, Here's the average you know, growth over the next couple of years. We feel fairly stable. There could be a lot of volatility in, in financial markets that, that certainly um, uh, Mark's customers would be much more worried about. I think that's the end of the slides and the presentation. So we'd love to have any questions. And it could be a microphone, it could be a card, it could be tweeted. I don't tweet, so someone else is going to have to take that tweet. I don't tweet. I'm not a Twitter. Thank you for the um, great update. Um, so we have a lot of underlying problems that we haven't fixed uh, with our economy and rising health care, like I think it's 10% of the GDP, Social Security with our aging population, and then we have about a 20, I don't know what our deficit is now because we never talk about it anymore, but it's got to be getting up to 20 trillion. So talk a little bit about what all that means and when that catches up with us as a country and what do we do about it? I'll, I can start. 
Okay. Um, because I don't worry about those things, so I can start. I don't worry about anything anymore. Um, uh, healthcare costs are going up for, for a number of reasons and have been certainly a concern, although healthcare inflation, which is our main concern, has been slowing. Um, and that's partially because we're putting more market-based controls on these things through, um, uh, 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 through the American um, uh, Health Care Act, the Affordable Health Care Act. Uh, so I think we're moving in the right direction um, uh, there. But, you know, my, my, uh, uh, but at the same time, the population is aging and, and using up um, additional health care. But all the statistics, all the projections for health care costs are going forward are actually falling. From the government's perspective, is that with this lower healthcare inflation, all of these numbers are, are becoming quite uh, quite a bit improved, which is what we need. We don't we're, we're not going to stop people from aging. That's not where the solution is going to lie. It's going to be lie in, in in controlling healthcare inflation. We've made a mess of that system over the past 30, 40, 50 years, and it's not going to suddenly you know overnight you know transform into a, a, a more efficient system. But I think the direction is is definitely um, uh, positive. Um, uh, from what we see in the data right now. Uh, Social Security, I think, is a fairly small problem. It's like 1% or 2% of GDP can be fixed. Um, that's not uh, uh, what I worry about. Um, and I don't worry about the debt because that's Nobody's never been. proven to be a useful concern. Um, uh, in my opinion, I think that's an artificial concern is that if, if when interest rates keep going down, 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 that's telling me I'm not, I'm not supposed to be worried about this. And, you know, we we uh, don't entirely know what the limits are, but Japan has proven that the limits of, of debt accumulation are far greater than what anybody um, uh, believes uh, they, they are. So uh, I'm just not worried about that topic. And as Mark pointed out earlier, the, def the, the debt's going down, the deficit's going down anyway. So everyone's doing a high five because the deficit's 486. Bush's last couple of years was just over 500 billion. Those were huge. I mean, think back to where you were in 2008. 500 billion deficit. Everyone was outraged. It was that high. Um, so, as a percent of GDP, it's a much smaller number today than it was back then. But it's still a big number. And to your point, we're getting close. I think to 18 trillion in on what the, the debt is. And a couple of years ago, three years ago, when I did this presentation. I said that one of my concerns is what happens when you start paying interest on it. Because right now, uh, close to two thirds of the national debt is due within three years, so you're paying zero. Um, because we're not paying anything on the short term rates. And two or three years ago, the amount of uh, debt, the, the interest expense that we were paying was about the same as it was when Bush had $5 trillion of debt, because rates were much higher back then. And I know the numbers have changed a little bit. My concern is not for 2014 or 15 or 16, but as you start pushing interest rates up and paying interest on $20 trillion of debt instead of $5 trillion, which I guess when Bush left was actually 10, what does that do to the federal, uh, the federal uh, budget as the part of the pie that is, you know, debt service just starts becoming a bigger number? So the amount of absolute debt doesn't matter in Japan because they pay zero percent interest because their citizens buy all their debt and they're happy doing that. But what happens if we have to start raising our rates and we're paying interest and, and most of that, or, or the majority of it, matures within three years. And so you can start seeing these immediate increases. It's like the person who bought uh, an interest only home, 110%, loan to value, and all of a sudden interest rates start adjusting on it. You get in trouble. I think that's a, a problem down the road that needs to be addressed. You just can't keep piling on the debt, and then all of a sudden have interest rates go up. So a, a little bit of disagreement on that, but in Japan it works fine because their citizens just buy all their debt and are happy to get nothing on it. Yeah, so, so what I, I would remind, though, is that, um, again, to the extent that interest rates rise is because the economy improves. To the extent the economy is improving, means tax revenue are higher and spending is lower. Um, uh, those automatic stabilizers kick in, so that helps offset you know, some of the, the, the higher debt the higher debt cost concerns. So I'm not 
Um, again, I, I think there's a, a more positive equilibrium out there than sometimes we, we give it credit for. And, you know, the, 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 always the concern is that, um, you know, for somebody stops buying the debt and then interest rates spike, and that becomes the kind of problem that, that uh, 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 you know, we've seen in some other countries over time. Uh, but again, the countries that we've seen that in, and I think this is a key issue, uh, don't have the ability to print their own debt uh, oftentimes. So they borrowed in dollars and they can't print dollars. And so there is a possibility of a sudden stop in the flow of, of capital. The US and Japan always have a central bank backstop. Um, push comes to shove, uh, they, can, they can try to create inflation to get rid of the debt, but they always have a backstop that says, you know, we can control the pace of, of, of interest rates. And we've proven that, I think, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, crisis. Whereas the European countries, the ECB was never willing to be that backstop. Um, and that's why interest rates spiked in, in very unusual directions in, in Europe and created those exactly kind of debt scenarios. I think, I tend to think those were self-imposed, you know, punishments um, uh, rather than market-imposed uh, punishments. So, I, I take, you know, uh, the more what me worry. Um, it's like the offer you knew when approach to economics here today. Um, uh, uh, but yeah, again, again, I think we're in a pretty positive part of the cycle. And, and uh, you know, these, these, these stories that we're talking about, even should they emerge, I don't think either of us would expect them to emerge tomorrow. I mean, no, you know, these true. are, as Mark said, you know, concerns down the line. Yeah. Um, uh, rather than, as far as the immediate concern, is that our, locals, our, our local communities and our local businesses should be riding this cycle while it's here um, and anticipate that they can ride it for a little while longer. All right, uh, just a reminder that we do have the index cards on your table. If you'd prefer, you can go ahead and write your question on there. And uh, staff will be walking around, just hold them up and they'll pick them up. Um, but I also have a mic in my hands. Would anybody else like to ask another question? Right here, Tim. Oh, there we go. Tim, uh, you mentioned the uh, trillion dollar student debt, uh, the debt bubble with the student debt. Can you comment on what you think that will do in the future? I, I have concerns that it's going to be worse than the housing bubble. Um, I don't.